So the setting of our message this morning is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And um, last week we talked about the parable of the seeds and how Jesus Christ explained that the kingdom of God is like a seed that is planted in the heart. And we have a collective or an individual and a collective lesson with that. But how the kingdom of God grows within the soil of the heart. And, and prior to that, we talked about the parable of the sower as well. So after um, Jesus finished this teaching, the, par- the parables of the seeds, he and his disciples uh, got into a ship, into a boat. And they set sail from the region of Galilee where they were, uh, they were ministering. And um, they set sail from this, this place that they were at. And they, they were traveling to a place across the sea called the region of the Gerasenes. Now, the Gerasenes was uh, in the territory of what they called the Decapolis. And the Decapolis consisted of 10 cities uh, with a majority of the population being uh, Gentiles. And when they set sail from the shores of the Sea of Galilee on, on, on the, the Galilee side, Jesus had a mission in mind before he set out with his disciples. And, you know, I, I've read this story many, many times. Over the years, I've studied the scriptures and read this story a certain way. But I didn't catch something that I believe the Lord's revealed in his word, that I hadn't actually seen. I think that when we look at the the, the passage of Scripture, our our text today is is Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to chapter 5, verse 20. Sometimes when we're reading the word of God, we can break it down into into the stories and kind of focus in on the one story. But there is a big picture in this particular uh, passage of scripture that I think we shouldn't too quickly overlook. And it's something that I've overlooked many times. But um, when Jesus asked his disciples to get into the ship and, and that they were going to set sail for the Gerasenes, he had a mission in mind before they even left. And I believe that the enemy knew that Jesus was up to something. Why would Jesus choose to sail to the Gerasenes, a territory where most of the people were Gentiles? Jesus came primarily for the lost sheep of Israel, but he had a specific mission in mind. You see, I, I believe the enemy knew, Satan knew, that Jesus had a reason for setting sail to this location. And like he always does, Our enemy, when he sees that God is planning on doing something good, there is active resistance that takes place against God's plan. The enemy likes to try and keep his strongholds intact. And Jesus was planning on running some interference on his territory. So I believe the enemy wanted to stop them or interfere with them in making their way across. Now, the enemy knows who Jesus Christ is and knows the power of who they're dealing with, but it's like a futile attempt to try and stop something. After ministering to the multitudes in Galilee and sharing with them these parables of the growing plants and how the kingdom of God works in the hearts of people, Jesus, they set out from this shore in a boat. It says there are other boats with them as well. But Primarily, Jesus was with his disciples in this ship. Having ministered to the multitudes on the shores, it says that he was ministering to multitudes. I I think Jesus, in his physical being, was extremely tired. So it says when they got in the ship, he curled up on a cushion in the stern of of the boat. And he fell asleep. But while they were en route to the garrisons, We read in Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35, that a ferocious storm 
blew up on the sea. Jesus was asleep. He was fast asleep. And his disciples were absolutely terrified with what was happening. And I believe that the backdrop to this storm has much significance. In your Bibles, let's start reading from verse 35 in Mark chapter 4. You can follow along on the screen if you wish. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just and just as he was in the or just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, he rebuked the wind and the wave, said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now after teaching these parables, Jesus advised his disciples he wanted to go to the other side. Isn't it just like Jesus to ask followers of his to go on an adventure with him? You ever feel like your life's an adventure? I I surely do. I mean, you probably do too, right? And sometimes in adventure, you don't know the twists and the turns, and there's surprises along the way. Some of them are good surprises, and some of them are downright scary. Well, this particular surprise to the disciples as they began to follow the Lord's instruction to cross the sea was a scary thing. There are enemies in our lives as we're walking in the Lord, that we're going to encounter. It's not a matter of when we're going to face resistance, or if, it's, if we're going to face resistance. It's a matter of when. You walk with the Lord, you're going to face resistance. Before we continue this story, I, I think it'd be good for us to reflect on the specifics of what the ministry of Jesus consisted of? What was the primary mission and ministry of Christ? In Luke chapter 4, 18, we read about Jesus. At the start of his earthly ministry, he's in his hometown of Nazareth. And he's in the synagogue. And they're having a synagogue session, much like a church session for the Jews. And in that synagogue session, they read from the scroll, and they read from the prophets. And they hand the scroll of Isaiah to Jesus, and this is what he reads. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. I find this is very interesting. This is the start of his ministry. They rejected him in Nazareth. They said, who is this? It's Joseph's son. They didn't respect the fact that he was launching something that would change the course of history because he, in fact, was God in the flesh, the son of God who was born of a virgin to set his people free from captivity. And in setting collectively people free from their captivity, it drills all the way down to the individual that is set free from captivity. You see, in our text, the disciples had no idea what would await them on the other side, but Jesus knew, and Jesus had a plan. And his plan was to run interference on enemy territory. In a certain case, to proclaim freedom for a man who was waiting on the other side, being held captive as a prisoner 
of the devil and his minions. And Jesus' plan was to set him free. Now, when we travel with the Lord through life, God's going to direct our paths. The Bible says that. If you believe Jesus, you can be sure that the Lord is going to direct your path. And he leads us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And those paths of righteousness intersect people along the way who are held captive by the enemy. Now, the 12 disciples that were with Jesus on his mission when he walked the earth, they were firsthand witnesses to how Jesus Christ proclaimed good news to the poor, how he proclaimed freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, and how he set oppressed people free. And the scripture that we just read in Mark, when the disciples were asked to cross over to the other side of the sea, they were not anticipating a major storm en route. They had no idea what was going to come at them. Jesus knew about the storm before they even went. He's God. He knew. But he wasn't concerned in the least, was he? Why? Because he knew that his purpose would be accomplished and that nothing would stand in the way of his mission. He was not concerned about the possibility of a storm blowing on them. He was curled up, sleeping on a cushion in the stern of the ship. Now on the path of life, when Jesus tells us to go to certain places, you can be guaranteed this. Jesus never tells you to go to a certain place unless he's got a good reason for it. There's just no chance. When you're a child of God, the steps of God's children are led by him. There's no chance involved. Now, I believe that this storm that came up on the Sea of Galilee was a supernaturally derived storm. We see the enemy threw supernatural things towards Job when he was tried, and I believe this was kind of similar. He knew that Jesus was up to something and he threw everything he could at that boat to try and discourage them from crossing, to try and stop them from going to the other side, and if possible, to even kill them. And the squall broke out while they're in the middle of their journey. What were the disciples doing? They were sailing the ship while Jesus was sleeping. They were panicking. They were thinking that this might be the end for them and their ship. Because the waves were so large, it was hard to ignore them because they were washing over the boat. They were doomed. And in fact, without some kind of intervention, they in fact were doomed. These men were experienced mariners. We're not talking, you know, like these guys made a living fishing before they followed Christ. Most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. For them to be concerned that their lives were in peril... It would have taken an awfully big storm for them to be concerned about that. And they would know that this is a life-altering event that's taking place here. They cried out to Jesus, who was rousing from his sleep. Don't you care if we drown? In the midst of the storm, the disciples had forgotten all about who had called them on the journey that they were on. And who was in charge of the outcomes. They let fear become their master and they looked at the waves that were surrounding them and crashing over their boat and they panicked and they said to the Lord, don't you care if we drowned? Meanwhile, Jesus, he wasn't concerned about the storm. He was on a mission to save someone on the other side of that journey and nothing was going to stop it. Nothing was going to interfere with that plan. He looked at his disciples, kind of looking at them. Quiet, be still, he says. Quiet, be still. That's all he had to say. He didn't have to jump up and throw something at the water. He didn't have to shout. He just said firmly, quiet, be still. And the storm immediately abated, went away, and the seas became calm. And then he looked over at his disciples 
And he said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him? Wow. I mean, we're talking, these disciples had already witnessed him doing fantastic miracles already. Jesus had shown very clearly that he was capable of taking care of things. But in the midst of the storm, they forgot. How quickly do we forget when life throws a storm at us? When God tells us to go somewhere and we're crossing over and all of a sudden the enemy is running interference because we're trying to run interference in his kingdom. (laughs) How long does it take us sometimes to realize who is in charge of the boat that we're on? It's not me. The storms of life are out there. It's not you. The squalls that come up can be fierce. And without divine protection, we're toast. We're going to sink. We're going to drown. But that wasn't the purpose of God. In light of these facts, Jesus' ministry in the Gerasenes reveals the Lord's remarkable concern, not only for Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles. It's no secret that we live in a dark place. The world is filled with darkness. And there are real bad bad things happening out there. There are real adversaries. There are demons that are out there trying to, to kill and destroy. The man who was bound on the shores when they went across the other side had evil spirits in him. Mark 5, 1 to 20, starting verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with the stones. Now, in the modern day, there seems to be so many people that make light. They make light of the presence of demons amongst us. Some people find them a novelty or a curiosity and Maybe it's because we live in this desensitized era where everyone's watching movies with high tech and you know, monsters and demons and stuff are, are shown on the screens and you know, people are punching them out and all this kind of stuff. And it, it, it almost becomes entertainment for some and they, just take, they don't take it seriously. Maybe it's video games and stuff. You're, you know, people are going around kicking butt on monsters and evil and they're desensitized to the reality of the fact that there is a real devil out there and he's destructive and he's bent on influencing humanity to keep them away from salvation. The reality is that the devil and his demonic servants, they are no friends of people. They never have been and they never will be. And they're not to be trifled with or shrugged off as a fable as many people do. The Bible calls Satan a thief. In John 10.10, Jesus tells us that his purposes amongst humanity, the devil's purposes, are to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his purposes. In the case, the man living amongst the tombs in the garrisons was gross, grotesquely overtaken by evil. It's not said in the text how this man came to be possessed by evil spirits, but it's likely the result of him yielding to some kind of sin and opening himself up, dabbling in some kind of occult behavior, inviting these evil spirits to come in. Here we read, this man lived alone in the cave of a tomb, tormented and living amongst the dead. The evil spirits that possessed this man gave him superhuman strength. It's often a characteristic of a person who is possessed by an evil spirit. The, The angels... The fallen angel, this demon, uh, you know, takes over the members of that person's body and does all kinds of horrible things with them and through them. 
Now, angelic beings, we're told in Scripture, both good and evil, are more powerful than human beings the way we are in this physical realm right now. They're more powerful than us. And they will do demons when they take over a person. They're, they're not friends of people. They're bent on destruction, and they'll do what they want to lead that person to destroy and to be destroyed. And this story is an example to us of what the agents of the kingdom of darkness can do to people when they're invited in and when they're given free reign. Once they take over, that person is in absolute torment. We should never underestimate the destructive power of our enemy. I'm not saying that we bow down to it because I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Okay? We don't bow down to that. We don't shrink away and fear from that. But it's not because you or I have the capability of resisting our enemy on our own strength. We don't. We're called to be alert and sober-minded when it comes to spiritual warfare that we encounter. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. The devil is bent on trying to inter run interference with the mission that God's given us. Just like, in this case, when they're traveling over to the Gerasenes. The devil's a robber. He's a thief. He's a robber. This poor man that was bound... Maybe he didn't realize it when he first opened his spirit up to the demons, but once they took over, they broke him big time. This man lost his home along with the fellowship of his family and friends. You can imagine him screaming out in, in, in torment, running amongst the hills and amongst the tombs, screaming out and cutting himself because he didn't know how else to, to let the, the suffering that was taking place inside him out. Horrible. From what we read here in the book of Mark, it's apparent that someone along the way tried to restrain him. Possibly to keep him from hurting himself. Possibly to keep him from hurting other people. All this was done to no avail. Scriptures tell us, right? They weren't successful in restraining him. Even though they bound him with chains and shackles, he would snap the sh chains and b break off the shackles off of him. He was that strong in demonic power. Nothing and nobody could bind this man when they tried to restrain him. Night and day, this poor man was crying out, running around, tormented. And there was one the Son of God, who saw this man where he was. He saw him across the Sea of Galilee. And he decided that he was going to go and rescue him because of his great love for that man. See, society isn't able to help people like this. It's just as true today back as, as back in the first century. You can try all you want. You can give counseling all you want. You're not going to see someone who's bound by demon spirit freed. The only power under heaven that can free that person from demons is the power of the Lord God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that there's not mental illness out there. Sometimes there is. And it's physical or it's psychological. It's just a chemical thing. Or maybe there's emotional damage from past things that have happened. And yeah, maybe that's, there's influence from the enemy who's trying to destroy that person in a certain way or whatever. Or maybe, you know, sometimes there's, there's disease or illnesses that can cause a person to be not in their right mind. So not everything, not every time you have an issue with mental health is a demon possession, okay? And there's been mistakes made over the years, but don't get this wrong. The world out there would like to write everything off as psychological. There is real demon power out there and people that are held captive. And you, as a believer, if you are, are, 
are called by the name of Christ to be his disciple, you're going to run into these people out there. You're going to run into these things. So the question is, can you resist all that evil? What, what if you or I were to go to the Gerasenes in that day? In our own strength, could we overcome this? Absolutely not. But there is one who travels in our boat with us, that who travels beside us, and as a matter of fact, whose spirit has been given to us, that indwells us, the Holy Spirit, whereby we have been given authority in Jesus' name to trample on snakes and scorpions. Not for the sake of trampling, but for the sake of seeing people that are bound by the devil set free. That's the purpose of it all. That's why Jesus came. See that mission in the prophetic word of Isaiah? That's why Jesus came. He came to set people free and to bring bring people into freedom, to bring them into the kingdom of God and praise God, you and I, if we accepted the Lord, have been set free. Society can't help a demon-possessed person. When Jesus saw, when he saw Jesus from a distance, they, so they roll up onto the shore in the garrisons, and there's this her, herd of 2,000 pigs or so grazing on the hillside in, in one area, and then there's this, this, these tombs, and there's this man up there, and he's out of his mind. When he saw Jesus from a distance, we see in verse 6, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Now these demons, when, this, when, when Jesus and his disciples landed on the shore, they recognized him. They knew he's coming for us. He's coming. And the demons in this man immediately recognized the authority of Jesus as the Son of God. They were terrified that he had come to where they were. The possessed man ran up to Jesus, fell on his knees, and fell on their knees in this, in the, embodied in this man, begging for mercy. No doubt that these demons recognized the fact that they were doomed for judgment on judgment day. And they understood that the one who stood before them had much more power than they had. And as such, in consideration of this, they were unsure of what Jesus was going to do with them as they, Jesus had come all the way across the sea and had landed at that point where he was. At the consideration of this, they, they likely were aware that uh, some of the spirits that were disobedient and fell out of favor with God because of their sin were sent straight into the abyss, it says. Jude chapter, Jude 6, verse 6. Jude 6. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now, not all evil spirits are in this place of holding, this place where they're chained in this hell that they're holding in. Some are, have been permitted to roam the earth, including Satan himself at this point. There will come a time when he's bound and he's pushed, pushed into this pit, this abyss as well. But the, these spirits entered this man. And the evil spirits living in this man identified themselves as legion because there were so many of them. Now, if you weren't aware, in the Roman army in those days, a legion is consisting of 6,000 men, 6,000 soldiers. And Jesus permitted this particular spokesperson for these demons that were in this man to speak on their behalf. We read in verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside, the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out 
and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I've read this passage and I'm, I'm going, hmm, why? What's going on here? When reading this passage, you might ask, well, why did, why did Jesus send this particular legion of demons into the pigs when he could have sent them into the abyss that he had sent other angels into who were disobedient? It's apparent, and they were begging. It's apparent that God had permitted and has permitted and continues to permit some of the evil spirits that are out there that were disobedient to him to dwell on the earth while some were bound in these chains reserved for judgment at the end of the age. Now, I mean, there is some speculation and there's some apocryphal literature that talks about this. I, you know, apocrypha you have to be careful with because it's not on par with the word of God. But there is some speculation and there is some indication in the word of God that um, some of these spirits may have been the ones that were involved with Genesis um, chapter 6, 2, which states the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose and we have the giants of old, the heroes of renown and all that coming from the Nephilim. Okay, it could be that God had taken those spirits that were involved in that and had locked them in the abyss because of the grievous thing that they had done. It's a bit of a mystery. We don't have all the answers to this. Okay? But nevertheless, it's clear that there are evil spirits roaming the earth, and evil actually serves as a catalyst to act as a catalyst so that people will have a choice between good, between evil, between God and the kingdom of darkness. So they're permitted to carry on their mischievous and, and wicked activity. Now, Jesus allowed these... Let's make one thing clear. Okay? Jesus uh, did not um, destroy those pigs. The evil spirits destroyed him. He permitted it to happen. Maybe he was using... Um, this miraculous event to show people who are observing the miracle, the great malice that the evil spirits that were possessing this man had, the destructive influence that they wished to, to do wherever they went, including in this poor man that had them in him. Jesus had already shown his disciples that he had power and authority over nature to calm the raging seas. Now he shows them his power and authority over spiritual realm to take these demons and order them out of this man. And this 6,000 strong legion, if legion correctly identifies, an, I mean, there's speculation it could mean just a great number, but if this man had 6,000 demons in them, okay, humanly speaking, you as a human without Jesus can't resist one demon. And here's the Son of God. They're trembling. They're, because he has all a power and authority over every spirit that is out there. There is nothing that even comes close to the power of the living God. Nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth. No spirit, no being out there compares to the great I am. He is Lord over all. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over the sea. He's Lord over the elements. He's Lord over the spiritual um, forces out there. I think there was lessons to be learned in this, and there's probably more lessons than we've talked about here, even. But the bottom line is that Jesus delivered this man from the evil spirits because of his great love. He went all the way across the Sea of Galilee into this region, understanding that the deliverance of this man would be his mission when he arrived. See, 
This reflects the ministry and the mission of the Son of God. All unbelieving people, even those who are not possessed like this man was, with the evil spirits pulling him around like a puppet. They're bound as slaves. Unbelieving people are bound as slaves to sin in the kingdom of darkness. And the devil is master over them because of sin. And this is a real snapshot into the prophetic ministry that Jesus fulfilled from Isaiah. And he's still fulfilling today because when we are sinners, we're held captive by the destroyer until Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, delivers us from the tyranny. This is why Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. Learn from me. My yoke is light and easy. Compared to the devil and his cruel task mastering that he does to destroy and disfigure, to grotesquely make what God has made in his image to be ugly and, and putrid, Jesus came to set people free from that. You and I are set free from that. Before we knew Christ, spiritually we were naked, torn and disfigured. And we walked amongst the corruption of this world until Jesus shone his light, called us by name, and shone his light into our spirit and gave us soundness of mind. This is, don't, do you see the parallel between this man was an example of what evil does inside of humanity? But all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And all of us need God's forgiveness and his redemption to be set free from the kingdom of darkness. And this is a prime example. Even the fiercest opponent to Christ, 6,000 demons, are falling down trembling in front of him and going, what do you want with us? What do you want with us? Have you come to torment us? They tremble. They have a type of faith, but it's not a saving faith. So, some people have criticized why Jesus would cause the destruction of the pigs. He never caused the destruction of those pigs, just as God never causes evil to take place on the earth. He permits it, but he doesn't cause it. It's a permission that he gives to be a catalyst between him and the opposite of him. The darkness versus the light. Those tending the pigs ran off, we read, reported this in the town and country. So you can imagine how horrified these guys that were tending the pigs were. 2,000 pigs go rushing down the hill into the lake, and they're all squealing and shrieking, and, and they drowned. And these guys that are tending the pigs, ah, they're freaked out. They ran off, it says, and reported this the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when the people came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him go, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to the tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. <laughs> what a story. Well, let's talk about the people first that came and inspected what was going on here. Rather than being really truly happy for the man who had been delivered from the legion of demons, they were freaked out. The people who were tending the pigs were terrified at what they had witnessed. They ran off into the town and countryside telling everyone what happened. And the people came out to see for themselves what was going on. Now there's no doubt as to the reality of this miracle. This 
demon-possessed man had been there for many years. I'm sure he was really well known to the people in that region. You, you can just imagine that he would be the subject of campfire stories and spooky stories around the campfire. Did you hear about that guy at the tombs? Ooh, he, we tried to bind him with chains and he shattered the chains and he ran off. Who knows what he, he did? So these people knew about this guy that was living amongst the tombs. To see this wild man that they knew in the past, fully clothed, peaceful, calm, and rational, sitting before Jesus, that was proof that the power of God was resting on Jesus. But along with the wonder of seeing this man who had been delivered, there was another sight to behold, and more than 2,000 pigs had drowned in the lake. Now, it's very likely the men who had been tending the pigs would have wanted to tell the, the owners, if you make sense of this, right away what had happened, because guess what? They were responsible for caring for those pigs, and they were all dead. So they wanted to make sure that they told the owners what happened. And the tenders would have wanted uh, to be, make sure that they weren't blamed for this, right? That's one thing. So they were thinking about themselves and about protecting their, their interests. And when you can think, of, they're in a Gentile region. It's like, that's an awful lot of bacon. 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of bacon. And the meat from the pigs, from 2,000 pigs, is a lot of pork. It's fair to say that as a result of this incident that took place, there would be a shortage of pork in the Gentile markets in that region, in the surrounding towns of the Gerasenes. There would be a shortage of pork because of this. And the owners and people who had likely vested business interests there talked amongst each other, and they were afraid that uh, if Jesus stayed in their region to conduct further ministry, there might be further incidents which might damage their local economy. So it says they, they begged him to leave the region. I think that makes an awful lot of sense to the human mind. Protect their business interests because they figured that this guy, what's he going to do next? He goes, you know, is he going, like, they had no idea, but they, what an opportunity these people lost. If they would just seen it for what it was, seen this guy that was possessed in his right mind sitting next to them, next to Jesus, freed and rejoiced and, and welcomed the Lord. What an opportunity the, the region asked, missed by asking him to leave, eh? But this man who was freed, he was so thankful for what had been done for him. And this was the right response that he had, you know? Lord Jesus, let me follow you. Let me come with you. But Jesus had other plans because Jesus didn't just see the guy on the shore with the demons in him. Jesus saw the future of what would happen when that guy was set free and he would take the message to his own people because he cares. He came to seek and save the lost and his purpose was far bigger than just one person. Not that he wouldn't have come across the lake for that one person, but his mission was far bigger. So what I'm trying to say this morning, folks, is this. Hillside Community Church, we're a body of believers that have come to Jesus, to follow Jesus. Now, there's, there's some people that maybe have never surrendered their life to Christ that come to services sometimes. And if you're one of those people that you've never really surrendered to Jesus, you need to do that. He's calling you. He's asking you to give your life to him. If you're online this morning and you're listening to this message, Jesus has freedom for you. He loves you. And if you're listening out there or you're bound by something, Jesus can set you free. So come unto the Lord. Come to him. Allow him to set you free from the shackles and the chains that bind you spiritually. And maybe you're listening out there and you are demon-possessed. God has freedom for you. He, he's seeking you out. You're watching this because he's seeking you out. God loves people. Is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world 
but to save the world through him. And children of God, saints of God and Hillside Community Church, make no mistake, the Lord has called you into his boat and he's taking you to places to walk with him in the fulfillment of his mission. He's got a mission out there in this community and in the connections that he has in you, through you. The Holy Spirit has called you to a certain place. And while you're on that journey, God wants to use you and your life to speak the clarity of the gospel with your testimony and with the power of God in you and the word of God in your hand. He wants to make you effectively uh, missionaries wherever you go. He wants that for you. And he's called you. And that that journey that he's called you on is a great adventure. And when you start on that adventure, guess what? There's going to be scary things that come at you. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of demons. Don't be afraid of anything that tries to sidetrack you from the mission that God has in mind for you. Because greater is he that is in me and you as a believer in Jesus Christ than he that is in the world. Amen? And that's something to be thankful for because the shadow of the Almighty rests over top of us and shrouds us, protects us. When we go, nothing happens to us outside of his will. It doesn't matter if the waves are breaking over your boat right now. It's kind of scary out there in the world right now, isn't it? A lot of us have gone through some pretty stormy weather. Waves breaking over a boat. Lord, are you going to let us drown? No. Jesus has a mission. Trust him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes on Jesus, because all he has to say to that storm that's raging against you is quiet, be still. And they have to listen. The elements have to listen. The elemental forces of spiritual darkness in this world must obey the name of Jesus. The power in Jesus. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand, having done everything to stand. Amen. God's given you what you need to be overcomers and to fulfill the mission. Don't be discouraged. Don't get downcast when the breakers are coming at you because Jesus is in the boat with you. He may seem like he's not noticing and not caring and he's fast asleep, but he's not. He understands what's going on. He knew it before he even sent you. Amen.